All right, you guys, welcome back to another lesson. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Eddie Watson, and this is ICU Advantage, where I'm giving you the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making critical care subjects easy to understand. Now, my goal in creating this YouTube channel was to try and provide some of the best online and really free critical care educational content out there. And so if you'd be interested in getting more of these lessons, then make sure and subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon though and select all notifications. That way you never miss out when I release a new lesson. And so in today's lesson, we're going to be talking about various troubleshooting that may need to take place when you're temporarily pacing a patient. There are a few different things that can come up that can lead to improper or no pacing of your patient. And thus, it's very important to understand why this happens and more importantly, how to fix them. It can be quite unnerving, and I really know this feeling firsthand of when things are not going right and you're just not entirely sure of what you need to do to fix it. And so keep watching this lesson, and I'm going to do my best to try and explain some of this troubleshooting to you. All right, so let's go ahead and get started about our troubleshooting here. And to start things off, I really want to do a quick review over the topic of sensitivity. I covered this topic two lessons ago, but I really don't think I did a good enough job. So I want to do a quick review of it here just to make sure that we have a good solid footing and understanding this setting. Now our sensitivity, this is the millivolts that are required to detect a patient's heartbeat. So what this means is the higher the millivolt setting that we have set, the stronger the electrical activity has to be in order to be detected. And you can really think about this as being less sensitive. The pacemaker is not going to be as sensitive to the intrinsic rhythm because it's going to need more of that electrical activity, thus requiring a higher millivolt of electrical energy in order to trigger sensing on the pacemaker. Now on the flip side, the lower the millivolt setting is, the less electrical activity it's going to take to be detected as a heartbeat. And so thus we can think of this as being more sensitive. It's more sensitive to those minute electrical energies, picking that up as being the patient's heartbeat. And so again, it really helps us if we think about this like a fence. The fence here is our millivolt setting, and underneath the fence is going to be our patient's intrinsic heart rhythm. And you can think the higher up we are on the paper, the greater the millivolt of electrical activity that we see. And if we're thinking in terms of the sensitivity to see that underlying rhythm, the higher up that fence is, the higher the millivolt settings, the less sensitive we are to see that underlying activity. And the further down we go, the less millivolts it requires to be sensed, making this more sensitive. And so here you can see in this example here, if we have our millivolt setting too high, you're not going to be seeing the underlying rhythm. If we begin to lower that millivolt setting and become more and more sensitive, you begin to see the patient's intrinsic heart rhythm underneath. And here in this example, you're seeing just the QRSs. And this is really what we want to be detecting. This is in the example of we're sensing in the ventricle, we just want to see that QRS complex signifying a ventricular beat. Now you can see here, if we continue to lower our millivolt setting, we still have room in which we can go down, but we're still only seeing that QRS complex. And this is where I kind of talked about setting your threshold for sensing. And you want to give yourself a little bit of a threshold to where if things change, if you only have just barely the enough of a sensitive setting in order to just barely see the rhythm, if that millivolt activity drops, then suddenly you're no longer going to see the patient's intrinsic rhythm. If we determine that threshold and set that safety margin, here we're still only seeing the patient's ventricular rhythm, but we also have a buffer here for if that electrical activity output were to change for the patient, we're still going to continue to sense it. Now on the flip side, if we go too far and we lower this and make it too sensitive, now we're going to begin to see, in this example, the T waves, and we're going to be picking that up and thinking that that is also another beat of the patient's intrinsic rhythm. So again, think the higher the fence, the higher our millivolt setting, the less sensitive we are to seeing the underlying rhythm, and the lower the fence goes, the lower the millivolt setting, the more sensitive we are to seeing that rhythm. 
Hopefully that makes sense for you guys. It's really important to understand this setting in order to be able to do some of the troubleshooting that you need to do. All right, so now let's actually move on and talk about viewing our patient's intrinsic heart rhythm. Now, while this isn't necessarily a troubleshooting step per se, sometimes in the process of troubleshooting, it might help to know what your patient's underlying rhythm is and then comparing that to what the pacemaker is doing and trying to figure out where the disconnect is. So when it comes to viewing our patient's intrinsic heartbeat, there's really two methods that we can do this. There is the pause button, and then there's turning the rate down. Now for the pause button method, it's pretty simple. You just want to press and then hold the pause button for the time that you want the, the generator to be paused in order to view the patient's rhythm. And what this is going to do is it's going to suspend all sensing and pacing for a maximum of 10 seconds. And so the pacemaker is actually going to limit you to 10 seconds. So if you hold down the, the pause button for 15 seconds, after 10 seconds, it's just going to revert back and it's no longer going to be paused. The important thing to understand with the pause button method is that if the patient has no underlying rhythm, then they're going to have no heartbeat while you have the pacemaker paused. Now moving on to the other method of turning the rate down, this is actually going to be our preferred method. For this method, it's very simple. You just want to dial the rate down slowly until the patient's intrinsic rhythm is going to be observed underneath. Now, you don't have to go all the way down to zero when you're doing this. If you turn it down and no rate is seen when you're in the 30s and 40s, you can really assume that they either have no intrinsic rate or a very low and definitely pacer dependent rate without compromising their perfusion too much. All right, let's go ahead and move on from here, and let's talk about the first big problem that we're gonna discuss, which is gonna be our failure to capture. And so what this means here is that the output of our pacemaker pulse is failing to make the target chamber depolarize. The pacemaker is gonna be firing pacing spikes, but some or all of them are not gonna be captured by the myocardium. And you can really see that on the example here where we have all of these pacer spikes that are, are firing, but none of them are directly leading to uh, depolarization. And so your telltale sign of this is having visible pacing spikes seen, but no associated QRS signifying that electrical capture leading to contraction has not taken. You're also gonna see no contraction on either your A-line or your SpO2 waveform. So recognizing this on the EKG isn't that difficult, but it's not just the recognition of it that's important, it's understanding the causes so that you can possibly fix it. First potential cause could be from wire migration. The wire simply could have moved from the proper place in order to deliver that electrical energy. And so this may require the provider inserting the wire a bit more. Another potential cause of this could be our connections. You want to check that the connections are tight and secure because if they're not, this could lead to not delivering the full amount of electrical energy that you have it set at for the output. Now, speaking of output, this is another one of our potential causes here. And so simply our output might not be high enough. And so we just want to increase our milliamps until we achieve capture. And then once you have that capture, then you're going to want to, like I talked about two lessons ago, determine that stimulation threshold and set our output to that two to one safety margin. Now, after these three, there can be a multitude of other potential causes. And these could be things like electrolyte and acid base imbalances. And so we obviously want to correct those if they exist. Uh, could be the patient's having an MI. Uh, Post defibrillation can impact this. Uh, and even some drugs like flecainide, beta blockers, verapamil, other medications in that class, uh, they can also potentially impact this. And so essentially, if you are seeing this failure to capture in your patient, you want to go through these list of possible causes and work to try and correct them. But most importantly is that you want to be prepared to either transcutaneously pace and or initiate CPR if there is no capture and your patient either has minimal or no underlying rhythm. This is potentially an emergency situation. All right, so hopefully that makes sense for you guys. And so let's talk about the next potential problem, which is our failure to pace. And this is essentially the pacemaker is not delivering pacing impulses. 
And here, looking at our rhythm strip, no electrical spike is seen, and thus no contractions are taking place except for those that are due to their own intrinsic rhythm. Now again, this one's pretty easy to spot, so we need to think of the potential causes in order to fix them. Now, the first potential issue is pretty simple. It could just be from a disconnection. And so just check that all the connections are intact and secure, and also make sure that you are connected to the proper chamber. So if you're pacing the ventricle, but you're actually plugged into the atrium output. Another potential issue could be from insufficient power. And so here you wanna look for and check the battery indicator and then change the battery if needed. Now on this subject of batteries, it's important that you're always using new batteries with each new patient. The indicator on the generator box is gonna show us our battery life and on specifically the Medtronic, if we have the flashing light, this means we have about 24 hours left at our current settings. And while they definitely don't recommend changing the battery while you're actively pacing a patient, but in an emergency, the pacer will continue to pace for at least 30 seconds while the battery is out. So if you absolutely have to, you can quickly change the battery and your patient will continue to receive those pacing impulses. Now, another potential problem, and this will often be the most common cause of failing to pace, is something that we call oversensing. And so what I mean by this is our sensitivity is too high. So think our millivolt setting is too low and we're picking up too much electrical activity instead of just the QRS complexes. When this happens, this is gonna cause the pacemaker to think that it's seeing a faster underlying rhythm and thus not requiring the delivery of a pacer spike. So for example, if you have your pacemaker set at a rate of 60 and your patient's intrinsic heart rhythm is at a rate of 40, but it's also picking up each T wave, it's going to think the patient's rhythm is 80, it's only set at 60, so it's not going to deliver any impulses. And to help you recognize and troubleshoot this problem, I want you to remember over sensing is under pacing. If you're sensing too much, you're not going to deliver enough pacing. And so what you want to do here is decrease your sensitivity, so increase that millivolt setting until the pacer is appropriately firing. Again, once you reach the proper sensitivity, it's important, like I talked about two lessons ago, to determine that sensitivity threshold and set it in a 2 to 1 safety margin. Now, another potential cause of failing to pace is something that we call crosstalk inhibition. And basically what this means is in dual chamber pacing, atrial spikes can be sensed by the ventricle wire and vice versa. Now, typically this is avoided in the newer pacemakers uh, due to that blanking period to really try and prevent this. If you remember, I talked about that in the last lesson where after we deliver an atrial pulse, we're going to have a blanking period in the ventricular lead so that we don't pick up on that pulse. But if you do find yourself in a situation where this could be the potential cause to fix this, you either want to reduce the output, so decrease the milliamps, or reduce the sensitivity, increasing the millivolts in the opposite chamber. Now the final potential cause of failing to pace could be from a lead malfunction. And this could be the lead cracking, the insulation breaking off, but essentially we're just not going to be delivering the output to the chamber like it's supposed to. So essentially, if all else fails, this might be the culprit. And in order to fix this one, this is going to require a new lead placement. Now again here, just like with the failure to capture, if we have a patient that has either no underlying rhythm or very minimal underlying rhythm, then you're going to need to be prepared to transcutaneously pace or potentially perform CPR because they just might not be getting enough or any perfusion or beats. All right, so let's go ahead and move on and talk about our failure to sense. And so here, our pacemaker is going to be firing inappropriately as it's not properly sensing the underlying heart rhythm. And so just as we see in our example here, we're going to see these regular pacing spikes. But we're going to be seeing these regular pacing spikes at times when they shouldn't be. Depending when they fall in our patient's underlying rhythm, now some will lead to ventricular contraction, but others will not depolarize depending on where they land. 
So in our example here, we have contraction that's seen after the first couple beats, but then the patient's intrinsic rhythm actually picks up faster than what we have the pacemaker set at for our rate. But because the pacemaker is not sensing that rhythm, it continues to fire a couple beats and one of them comes kind of close to an R on T event. And so it's firing inappropriately here. It shouldn't have fired those two pacer spikes because it should have sensed the patient's underlying rhythm. Then from there, we see the patient's underlying rhythm slows back down enough to where we haven't had a depolarizing event. And so when that pacer spike comes through, this again triggers a contraction. Now here for failing to sense, there's really just one cause for this, and this is gonna be that our sensitivity is too low. And again, think about this as being your millivolt setting is gonna be too high. Now again, in order to help you recognize and remember this, I want you to learn the term under sensing is over pacing. And so in order to fix this, we need to increase the sensitivity. So we wanna lower that millivolt setting until the pacing is happening appropriately. Again here, think that we want to lower the fence to be able to see the underlying rhythm. And again, like anything else, like I discussed two lessons ago, once you get there, you make sure you determine the sensitivity threshold and set it to that two to one safety margin. All right, so fairly simple for our failure to sense. Lastly, I do want to just talk about some other potential issues that you might see. This isn't going to cover the full gamut of every possible troubleshooting scenario, but between what I just went through and covering some of the stuff here, this really should account for the majority of the major problems that you're probably going to come across. All right, the first thing I want to talk about is our lead displacement arrhythmias. And so what this is, is if a lead becomes dislodged that it can float around inside of the chamber and cause irritation of the myocardium. This is a problem that's more commonly seen in our ventricular wires, but it can lead to a lot of PVCs and even runs of VTAC. For this, you're going to want to get an x-ray for confirmation, and if the arrhythmia is significant enough, we may need to pull the wire back out of the ventricle until it can be properly placed. Now, another potential issue that can come up is something that we call pacemaker syndrome. And this is going to be in our dual chamber pacing that we may have dyssynchrony of the atrial and ventricular contractions. Your patient may end up experiencing fatigue, dizziness, palpitations, uh, pre-syncope, as well as you could see a greater than 20 millimeters of mercury reduction in blood pressure. Now, if this is happening, this may require adjustment of the AV interval. Now, another thing I want to talk about is if you see a transition from a left bundle branch pattern to a right bundle branch pattern. Now, if we see a left bundle branch block QRS pattern, th this is normally seen with our RV placement of a ventricular lead. But if we see this transition to a right bundle branch block, then this could mean that the lead has eroded through the intraventricular septum, leading to left ventricular initiation. Now here again, we're gonna get an X-ray to confirm this one, but fortunately this one is pretty rare. All right, so those were the primary ways in which we wanna troubleshoot our patients that are potentially having issues with their temporary pacemaker. Uh, I really hope that you guys found this lesson useful and that you liked it. If you did, please go down below and hit that like button. It really goes a long way to help support me in this channel. Uh, also, make sure and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you thought. I love reading your comments. And make sure and share this video with other people you think might find it useful as well. A special shout out to our awesome YouTube members and Patreon members out there. The support that you guys offer this channel is so greatly appreciated. You're really going to allow me to continue to do great things for this channel moving forward. For the rest of you guys, if you'd be interested in seeing how you might be able to show additional support, as well as some of the perks that come along with doing so, either join the YouTube membership down below or head on over to the Patreon page and, and check out some of those additional perks there. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, check out a couple really awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. You have a great day.